Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, this is an introductory lecture uh, thermoelectricity from Atoms to System. And here is the uh, real, what should be the motivation? Why thermoelectricity is important? I wanted to uh, provide a little more background information. Um, there is a lot of interest uh, in areas related to energy. This is a graph that shows the world marketed energy use between 1990 to 2035. Uh, this is a report that came out in 2010. What you see is that you have liquids, petroleum, coal, natural gas, renewables, and nuclear. While we're talking a lot about increasing of the uh, renewables and low carbon uh, energy sources, the use of uh, liquids, coal, and natural gas are not coming down. And uh, I just actually, when I was updating this, this is an updated report that came out three years later. It's actually quite inst uh, instructive to go back and forth and look at these two. You see that, uh, of course, with the discovery of the natural gas, the, um, na uh, from the shale technique, uh, fracking technique, uh, projection here have gone up, coal projections even uh, higher, uh, renewables keep going up, nuclears, they've had some little decline, they still predict to go up, but still this is not coming down. So my, um, uh, what I want to emphasize is that because um, of our significant reliance on uh, uh, liquid fuel and uh, uh, non-renewables, there is a potential to deal with, um, to use thermoelectrics. Uh, because whenever we burn fuels, we put uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. This is one of the um, uh, key graphs. Uh, this is from John Holdren's presentation, uh, or my, uh, Hansen at NASA, uh, that shows the CO2 cycle in the last uh, you know, 400,000 years. I know that there are some uh, sometimes debate about temperature increase, if the global warming, uh, how much we, uh, we are sure that is really happening and so on. I don't want to go in that part of it. What I want to say is that the CO2 in the atmosphere has been increasing and that is not under debate that has been measured. And these numbers are much more than they were for several hundred thousand years. So if we burn fuels, if we can do things more efficiently, um, uh, hopefully we should at least burn less fuels. Um, just to give you a perspective, these are numbers for uh, global world energy and ethanol production, photovoltaic, how they go up. These are exponential curve. This is some, uh, this was in 2006. These are some later updates. These show good increase, but if you compare them to the world energy uh, production, which was uh, 13 terawatt, that is uh, 13,000 gigawatt, these numbers are tiny. So that's one of the reasons that we need uh, we cannot neglect the fossil fuel and how this is done uh, and how, if we can do it more efficiently. So as an engineer, when you look at an energy system, the question is where are the places where we can have impact? This is a graph coming from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It tells you the energy sources for the case of US with uh, about um, uh, uh, one twentieth uh, of the world population, we consume about a quarter of the world energy, about 3.3 .3 terawatt, and 85 percent of it is coming from fossil f sources. But and here it shows where they are used in transportation, industrial, commercial, and residential. But a key point is, 58 percent of the energy is rejected, and this is not used. And where most of the rejection comes is come from the power plants and from the transportation from cars. And both of these have been around for 100 years. While we try to improve them little by little, uh, the chances of significantly reducing these energy losses here and here um, are, uh, are not much with the conventional techniques. And that's a place that thermoelectrics could play a role. Just for a historical comparison, this is a U.S. energy flow in 1950. Um, at the time, the population of U.S. was almost half of today, but the energy consumption was about one third of today. So you see that per capita energy consumption since 1950 have gone up. At the time, of course, 99% of the sources come from um, uh, fossil sources because we didn't have any um, uh, nuclear. Uh, but what is surprising is 
Rejected energy at the time was 49%. So if you look at the overall efficiency of the energy flow in the economy, it's worse. And so that's one of the things we discuss in the homework problems is that why do you think it happens while every technique has improved, um, uh, why we have this amount of rejected energy uh, less in 1950s than it was today. So uh, here is a different data for the whole world, not US, and not marketed energy, the whole energy. So the number estimation is a little higher, about 15 terawatts. This is where the energy sources come. This is where they are used. I don't want to dwell on this, but in, to go between, you have energy conversion devices. Heat engines in cars, burners, um, as well as electricity generation. And a key message is that more than 90% of primary energy is first converted to heat before we convert it to useful work. And the overall end use exergy. Exergy is ability of energy to do work, energy multiplied by the Carnot factor. The overall end use exergy is 12% of the resources. So when we say the world uses 15 terawatts, in reality is uh, less than two terawatts is actually uh, uh, useful work. So that's where there is significant amount of heat and that's something that we can do something. Uh, and that's why uh, I will describe a little bit what thermoelectrics could play a role. There is another area where interaction of heat and electricity is important is in, for example, microelectronics. Uh, this shows a typical one or two centimeter um, uh, side uh, chip uh, temperature profile. Uh, some areas are hotter than the others. How can you cool this? 15 degree temperature rise can lower the lifetime of a device by a factor of four. Instead of 10 years lasting, it lasts uh, two, three years. Why? Because exponentially uh, decrease in lifetime in a lot of uh, uh, processes such as electromigration, oxide breakdown, and so on. Um, in some of the power devices, in this case is a silicon control rectifier, the temperature on this micro scale could be hundreds of degrees above ambient. Um, here is a power density in today's chip. It has saturated, but still on the order of hundreds of watts. But the hot spot in the chip could be thousands of watts. This is an area where if we understand interaction of heat and electricity, we may be able to remove some of these hot spots locally, and that's one, uh, one of the potential for thermoelectrics that we are discussing. Maybe now is a good time to also give you a perspective of the history of thermoelectrics. Um, it is important to know about Abraham Yoffe's work. Um, first practical thermoelectric devices uh, were used at USSR during World War II. They had tens of thousands uh, of thermoelectrics built uh, to power radios from any available heat sources. They had soldiers, um, of course they cook and they eat, but uh, carrying battery, having battery was hard. So they actually were using some of the thermoelectrics to generate electricity at the time. In 1950s and 60s, many in US and USSR felt that semiconductor thermoelectrics could replace mechanical engines, much as semiconductor electronics were replacing vacuum tube technology. And actually, it's a quite interesting thing that it didn't happen. This original book by Abraham Yoffe really has a lot of insights about what limits the thermoelectric transport. And hopefully, these lectures uh, that you saw uh, early on from the atoms to the system uh, with the approach um, that uh, Professor Data and Lundstrom have uh, pioneered will give you a better insight about some of the microscopic reasons uh, why it's hard uh, to make such changes. Thermoelectrics are used today or has been, have been used in the last 30, 40 years. Successful example is radioisotope thermoelectric generator that powered satellites such as Voyager, Galileo, and Cassini. They are typically a big, um, kind of a container with general purpose heat source, which happens to be plutonium, generates lots of heat outside in the space is cold. Um, uh, from the temperature difference, you can generate uh, electricity. In this case, it's 55 kilogram, 300 watt electrical with 7% efficiency. This is the state of the art with silicon germanium, for example, but they lasted for 30 years. So this is a successful example. One of the challenges is how to make it higher efficiency, but even more important is how to make it cheaper. And that's one of the uh, uh, areas we will discuss um, in the system application in week five. 
uh, week four and five. Uh, another area where thermoelectric have been successfully used is in optoelectronics. Uh, today we use smartphones and uh, internet so much we don't pay attention, but the bandwidth of uh, telecommunication have increased many folds since 1980s because fiber optics allows to spend f f uh, signals and by putting multiple colors of light on the same fiber, which is called wavelength division multiplexing, you can actually multiply the uh, channel capacity significantly. But the color difference is sub-nanometer in the wavelength of the different lasers. And the best lasers, most stable uh, lasers we have is called distributed feedback lasers, have a temperature sensitivity of 0.1 nanometer per degree. So only a couple of degree is possible to make this laser uh, color become this laser. And that will be um, uh, affecting, of course, the error rate and so on. So every long distance telecommunication laser that is sold inside of it actually has a tiny thermoelectric cooler. So thermoelectric coolers have been used for telecom for this type of laser as well as detectors. These are two niche applications. The only newer thing that have happened in the last um, 10, uh, 15 years is thermoelectrically cooled uh, uh, car seats. Uh, many of you have the car seats that heat up and that's convenient, but what do you do in the hot areas in the summer? You cannot see it. You have to uh, open the door and uh, wait for some time before you can see it. These devices, thermoelectrics, have a, f a fast response. Within less than a minute, they can cool completely the seat, and this has been a commercial success. What is interesting is the technology of thermoelectrics here, the material is the same one was used in 1950s. So really it shows if you engineer the systems, even with the old materials, you have potential um, to have an impact. And this is uh, one of the areas we want to emphasize in the system week. Let me summarize it, uh, kind of the whole introduction motivation. Uh, uh, in the energy system, we have a significant amount of heat uh, that is wasted. Um, um, and one thing to consider is in the cycle to go from chemical energy to work, we lose a lot at the bottom, but also at the top. Basically, we burn fuel at temperatures of 1500, 2000 degrees Celsius in uh, burners in power plants, but the working fluid that uh, burn, that um, uh, turns the turbine is only five, 600 degrees Celsius. That is an area, a temperature gradient, which is called topping cycle, where thermoelectrics could have potential, and we will discuss it in these lectures. Thermal management of electronic after electronic is an emerging area. Micro refrigeration could allow us to do selective cooling. Um, and uh, a lot of the examples that we were giving uh, in terms of the device characterization come from this type of applications. Um, finally, uh, even if uh, you're not interested in energy applications, characterization of electrical and thermoelectric transport in nanocomposite can teach us quite a bit. There have been a lot of work on electrically conductive polymer that actually led to the Nobel Prize in early 2000. Um, when they were developing this composite electrically conductive polymer, one of the things they always measured early on was both electrical conductivity and the Seebeck coefficient. Even though they were not interested in energy conversion, Seebeck allowed them to see, uh, to understand the physics of uh, electron transport better because it has to do with the um, distribution of electrons, how they contribute to, to electricity. But more importantly, Seebeck coefficient is a bulk measure, is not uh, geometry dependent, so it can tell you something about inherent uh, carrier transport that may be uh, masked if you look at just the nanocomposite part of it. Um, uh, basically, uh, tiny electrical uh, regions with high electrical resistance dominate the current flow, uh, but they don't uh, uh, limit the heat flow, so it's possible uh, with uh, measuring the Seebeck coefficient have better uh, uh, understanding of uh, current transport in uh, nanocomposites. So here's a summary and uh, look forward. Um, uh, uh, as you see in the coming weeks, uh, we go from the micro scale, atomic scale, uh, try to explain what is the original, uh, uh, the fundamental reasons why the Seebeck effect happens and how we scale it up to devices, then how we measure thermoelectric effect in devices. And then we describe system and some of the latest advances in the field. Look forward to seeing the lectures.